welcome everybody. Welcome to the English summer. <laughs> Thanks very much for uh, coming here for what I think is going to be a fascinating discussion. Shortly I will be introducing uh, Stefano Vai on uh, this topic. But I'm David Wood, I chair London Futurist, and to kick things off I would like just to spend a few minutes setting some of the context uh, for some of the fascinating technological trends that uh, mean that we ought to be thinking hard about the future of biopolitics. And I like this graph particularly. This graph is a trend which has been taking place <laughs> since about 2001, which was the first time that people could say how much it would cost to sequence all the human DNA in a single individual. And at that stage, it was an expensive undertaking. It would cost $100 million, and it would also take a long time to do it. So it's not something that anybody would rush into in a hurry. But people did think this would be useful information to have at somebody's fingertips. So the industry had already been improving its abilities for quite a few decades earlier. It had been improving its ability to understand the human genome. And as you can see from this curve, this, de uh, this declining line here brought the cost down in just six years to $10 million. And people were saying, yes, there is a future here in which we will have this information about our personal DNA much more easily available. And people started to extrapolate this and say, maybe by the 2040s or 2050s, it's going to be cheap enough for have this information when you just go to the doctor. It will be routine to get this information. And actually, there's a very interesting uh, writer on biology. You may have heard of him. Richard Dawkins, Richard Dawkins from The Blind Watchmaker and The Selfish Gene and The God Delusion, he wrote a very interesting essay in 2002. He was contributing then to a book on uh, what people thought uh, the future would be like 50 years in the future. And I have to say most of the articles are pretty poor. But his article is very interesting. And he called his uh, article The Son of Moore's Law because he thought there would be a similar trend. This line here, this white line, is basically the slope coming down half in <coughs> two years is the rate of change which applies typically roughly in semiconductors. The semiconductors become cheaper and cheaper and powerful. But they projected then that maybe by 2040 or 2050 this would be cheap enough. But then the more interesting stuff started happening because people realized this would be so useful if you could do it more quickly. It would be so useful for health it will also be so useful for many profitable applications. And the industry went into overdrive. And what happened next is that it came shooting down much faster than the pace of Moore's Law. And so that it reached a thousand-fold decrease in just another four years in an industry that was already quite mature. In other words, the doubling rate had come down to five months. And that's the pace of change. And so rather than waiting for 2040 or 2050, tomorrow, that long-term future is now, in fact, just around the corner. And why has this happened? In part because of the financial incentives of companies getting in there and because of a great deal of technology. And uh, George Church, the professor at Harvard, has listed on his webpage 71 separate new technologies, which he calls next-generation DNA sequencing, to accelerate this. So there are lots of different smart people, smart companies involved. And even this is only a part of the story. Because at the same time, as the, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper to read DNA, it's also becoming cheaper and cheaper to write DNA. This is another version of the same curves taken from the synthetic biologist Rob Carlson's website. And he points out we can actually assemble life more and more cheaply. And The Economist wrote about this a few months ago. The Economist said, yes, now and man is creating life with a laptop strategically positioned right in the author's uh, vision as to how this new life could be created. And of course, there are many technological, biological technologies including stem cell therapies, regenerative medicine to generate new organs and so forth, designer babies possibly in which we can tweak what's in our babies rather than leaving it up to the Russian a Russian roulette genetic lottery as exactly what kind of children we have, possibly even redesigning ourselves as adults with the different genes. 
uh, possibly even undoing the effects of aging with this kind of new biology, as uh, summarized in the book Ending Aging, which some of us know from Aubrey de Grey. So that is the vision of uh, where this biological trend may be going. And if you think this is a bit abstract, uh, we have this comment here from uh, Brad Perkins, the Chief Medical <coughs> Officer at Human Longevity, who was in London a few weeks ago, and he said, a supercharged approach to human genome research is going to see as many breakthroughs in the next decade as in all of the previous century. So that is the possibilities ahead of us. But we're not here today particularly to talk about biotechnology as a technology. We're not going to go into long peptide chains and uh, mechanisms by which CRISPR works. Plenty of other people can look at that. We're here, in a sense, for an even bigger question is, what is our response to this possibility? And that is why we have invited Stefano Vai to come and talk to us. Because this is not just a matter of, hey, technology is cool, isn't it? It is a matter which more and more people are starting to wonder about. And briefly, we can see three groups of people. And I don't know if you want to identify with any of these groups. One group is the bioconservatives. The bioconservatives who say, this isn't going to end well. This is going to go terribly wrong. It may be okay in the short term, but it's a slippery slope, and before we know it, we'll be really in a bad way. We might <coughs> do fundamental damage to humans, fundamental damage to human society. There's going to be halves and half nuts, the genetic privileged, the genetically unprivileged. We should not be playing as gods. And I call them bioconservatives rather than just conservatives, because there are people in this camp from both the traditional left wing of politics and the traditional right wing of politics. And they both have a great kind of fear as to what might be doing done. There are some who are opposing genetically modified organisms. There are some who are opposing the possibilities to do wonderful stem cells uh, therapies. There's another group of people you might identify with instead. Not the bioconservatives, but the bio-libertarians. They basically say, hell yes, you know. Let's go ahead. Let's get this done. Let's trust the entrepreneurs who are already in this. Let's trust the technologists. They are good guys. Let's trust the corporations, the pharmaceutical companies. Let's trust the financiers, the banks. They are going to do wonderful things for humanity. Let's get the regulators out of the way. Let's get the governments out of the way. Well, let's not bother having the philosophers try and teach them what's going to happen. Let's say go hell for leather for this wonderful, better future. So I don't know if you identify with that group either. I think there's another group, which I call the transhumanists, which is, I think, won't say in the middle, but the best of both worlds, we welcome the chance to consciously and compassionately redesign the future of intelligent life. Yes, we're going to listen to the bioconservatives when they do point out dangers. And there are a few things that the bioconservatives say which do deserve our attention and do deserve our thought. But we should not uh, hold back because the opportunity is here to wisely improve upon human nature. Human nature is a wondrous thing, but human nature is a terrible thing. Humanity does terrible things to ourselves, to each other all the time. And if we could uh, take advantage of biotechnology, not just to make ourselves uh, taller and stronger, but to make ourselves better humans, then that is something worth pursuing. But not just letting it be driven by purely financial incentives, not just being driven by purely academic uh, concerns. It's got to be done from a conscious decision point of view, and that is, uh, in my view, what transhumanism is all about. So I don't know, as I say, if that captures your view somewhere along the line, and uh, we're going to have that discussion in terms of what possibilities are there, how should we be reacting. And it turns out there's a lot of philosophy in here. This isn't just chemistry, it's not just biochemistry, there's a lot of philosophy. And it turns out there's a lot of philosophers in the last 100 years or so have thought about many of these topics. Not necessarily in the same way. And so that is one of the angles that Stefano Vai is going to bring onto this talk. Because he is very well versed in lots of continental philosophers that I never quite got around to studying when I was at university. But people tell me and assure me are very relevant and important things to say. People like Nietzsche and Heidegger and Habermas. Uh, and lots of others. So we're going to listen to what the relevance of some of their thoughts is to these questions. Stefano is also a distinguished senior partner at an international law firm which is headquartered in Milan and he uh, is involved in a whole variety of different law cases including law cases to do with new technology. 
So he can bring not just a philosophical perspective, but also a legal perspective. And as it says here, he is uh, a professor at uh, Padua University on exactly this subject, new technology law. So I think that is the context point in which we should have a very important discussion as to where this is going and how do we want to get involved. Do we want to stop it? Do we want to just say, let's go and cheer from the sidelines as a, a armchair spectators? Or do we want to consciously get involved in steering these forces for the best possible future for all of us? So we're going to hear from that from Stefano Weiss. So welcome him all the way from Milan to London. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Good afternoon. So, <coughs> this uh, was, of course, uh, Also Sprache Zaratustra by uh, Richard Strauss, uh, and that's the soundtrack uh, of uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, film uh, of uh, 1970, uh, 2001 uh, Space uh, Odyssey. A film uh, which uh, uh, includes many concepts uh, and many memes uh, which are uh, discussed in the, the book uh, I'm going to uh, present today. So what uh, is this book uh, about? It's about uh, basically a single question. And the question uh, in uh, Martin Heidegger's words, uh, perhaps a little emphatic, uh, is, uh, is man, uh, as man in uh, his nature till now, prepared uh, to assume uh, dominion over the whole earth? If not, what might happen uh, to man uh, as uh, he is uh, so that uh, he may be able to subject the earth uh, and thereby fulfill the word uh, of another testament? Must man, as uh, he is uh, then, not be brought beyond himself uh, if uh, he is uh, to fulfill this task? And a few historical details, uh, the text that we are uh, speaking of today was uh, uh, first uh, uh, drafted uh, in uh, 2003 and in 2005 uh, uh, we had the printed book uh, in Italian and in 2007 uh, uh, we uh, realized uh, a web version in uh, a hypertextual format with all the links uh, to the appropriate sources, uh, which is uh, still available for free at uh, www.geopolitica.it. Uh, then uh, the book uh, raised uh, some uh, interest and uh, some um, uh, controversy uh, amongst the uh, people uh, who uh, uh, read the Italian uh, and uh, um, uh, an interview uh, was made by Adriano Shanka to myself uh, on the reception of uh, the book, uh, which uh, in turn became another printed book, uh, so a book on the book, uh, basically. And uh, in uh, 2010, uh, an English translation of uh, this interview was also published uh, uh, on the web at the address www.biopoliticswithanx.com and which became uh, available to the uh, English-speaking public uh, before the main text itself. Then, uh, in uh, 2014, uh, the uh, English translation was uh, uh, published uh, in print and for Kindle, thanks to the work of uh, Katharina Lam, who is uh, here with us uh, today. Uh, the printed copies uh, can only be bought uh, through uh, the um, uh, Italian uh, uh, online libraries, uh, such as, uh, for instance, Amazon.it, uh, while uh, the Kindle uh, version uh, is, uh, of course, uh, available uh, throughout uh, the, uh, the Amazon network. And there we are. So what is the biopolitics? What are we uh, speaking of when uh, we uh, mention uh, biopolitics uh, and why this is uh, important and this may be crucial uh, for our age? Uh, one of the first uh, writers uh, who uh, made use of the term uh, is uh, Michel Foucault. Michel Foucault describes biopolitics as a new technology of power 
that exists at a different level on a different scale and that has a different bearing area and makes use of a very different instrument. Uh, Foucault is of course uh, concerned, is worried about uh, this uh, evolution, but uh, he was writing that in the 60s, so he was quite a visionary in anticipating uh, a kind of development which uh, today is before our eyes. And it's interesting uh, to remark uh, that the very same philosopher was also the one who uh, announced, uh, who prophesied uh, posthumanism and the possible end of man. There again, uh, Foucault does not uh, take uh, a transhumanist stance. Uh, he's not necessarily in favor about that, uh, but uh, he's uh, uh, realistic uh, in his vision uh, about the fact uh, that uh, I'm reading again because I expected a much larger screen, so it is uh, perhaps uh, difficult for the people in the back uh, to, uh, to see that. And uh, he also wrote, uh, as the archaeology of our thought easily shows, uh, man is an invasion of a recent date and one uh, perhaps uh, nearing its end. If those arrangements were to disappear as they appeared, uh, if uh, some event of which we can at the moment uh, do no more than sense the possibility without knowing either what its form will be or what it promises, were to cause them to crumble, as the ground of uh, classical thought did at the end of the 18th century, then one can certainly wager that uh, man would be erased uh, like a face uh, drawn in sand uh, at the edge uh, of the sea. Oppose that uh, to the fact uh, that, uh, as my preface, uh, professor uh, say, uh, says uh, in uh, the preface to my book, uh, the future in the 90s uh, was, was still uh, widely seen as a continuation of a mere continuation of modernism. Similar to the present, with about the same sort of technology and society, only more of them, more of the same. Opposing this uh, was uh, the narrative, of course, uh, of uh, eco-disaster, the man-made distraction when uh, humanity, Prometheus like, uh, overstepped the natural boundaries. The green visionaries had uh, quite strict uh, uh, ideas of a decentralized, small-scale and self-sufficient uh, society in mind, a society that often felt particularly vulnerable to side pressure. But uh, this uh, naive uh, a vision according to which the future was just some more of what we were used in the past has been denied by the fact that Dolly and the rapid adoption of the internet show the fallacies of both the modernist vision and its proposed alternative. Not only was the future closer conceptually but qualitatively different from the popular, popular contemporary visions of it. The emerging technologies uh, seem to be applied uh, to change much of what was regarded as a fundamental human condition. And uh, this uh, is uh, uh, the most uh, significant part of the foreword to my book, uh, which was uh, kindly uh, written by uh, Valdemar Igda, if my Swedish pronunciation is correct. Maybe you can explain a little who Dolly is? Maybe not everybody knows? Uh, yes, of course, uh, Dolly is a famous uh, clone the ship. Uh, uh, Jan Wilmot uh, managed for the first time uh, to uh, clone uh, uh, a big mammal and uh, th this uh, was uh, perceived uh, as uh, the dawn of uh, a new age uh, where uh, biotechnology could uh, dominate both uh, uh, at the level of uh, um, agricultural and breeding industry but at the same time with obvious uh, application uh, to human beings. And it is interesting uh, to remark uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, Jan uh, Wilmot uh, himself uh, is a rabid uh, bioludite, which means uh, that uh, you can very well be uh, involved uh, in cutting edge science uh, and at the same time have a, a very strong anti transhumanist uh, stance. Uh, to be a scientist uh, does not mean uh, that you are a transhumanist. Uh, uh, to be uh, uh, involved in humanities uh, or in philosophy uh, does not require the, you to oppose that.
So what conclusions can we draw from the fact that the future is uh, going to be pretty different from the past in terms uh, of uh, politics, uh, which is uh, the subject uh, of, I, uh, of my presentation today, not of uh, technology. I take uh, the uh, technology uh, for granted, uh, especially given that I'm uh, addressing uh, uh, a public uh, which is obviously interested in uh, um, technologies of transhumanism, uh, transhumanist relevance. So first, we have entered a time when uh, politics uh, is against about Weltanschauung again. Not just the sociology, but also anthropology. It is not just how we want uh, our societies uh, to be organized, uh, but uh, politics uh, has become again uh, the subject uh, where we discuss uh, what it means to be human, uh, where we won't go uh, as a species. And uh, this at a level which is unprecedented, as we shall uh, see soon, uh, since uh, the Neolithic Revolution or even uh, hominization of, uh, itself. Second, where we are now uh, faced uh, with uh, uh, a concept of uh, bioethics uh, which is becoming increasingly fashionable at all levels, uh, at all levels, uh, say from hospitals uh, to the uh, agricultural industries uh, to uh, reprogenetic technologies uh, uh, to medicine and so forth. And of course, uh, there might exist uh, uh, bioethics, uh, as there is biopolitics, uh, as there is uh, perhaps uh, bioesthetics. But the very concepts of, of uh, bioethics itself uh, tends uh, to evade uh, the responsi responsibility that came with uh, great power, as in uh, Spider-Man. Namely, the responsive responsibility of uh, collective political choices in the name uh, of adhesion to allegedly universal eternal values of a humanistic nature. That is, uh, if uh, everything is just about the bioethics uh, and ethics uh, are uh, supposed uh, to be universal uh, and eternal, we have just uh, to make an application of uh, those uh, traditional humanistic uh, concept of good and evil, but we are uh, exonerated from making uh, political choices uh, about uh, where we want to go. That is, it is not a matter of a popular sovereignty, of a, a community defining uh, uh, its own uh, cultural and even biological identity, but rather it is just a matter to comply with uh, uh, ethical requirements. Third, transhumanist and radical uh, bioludites are at least in agreement on one thing, that is the fact that the great divide of this century will be on biopolitical issues, while many other people are still in denial and think it is after all business as usual. Uh, one thing uh, we, where we insisted uh, uh, quite much in the Associazione Italiana Transumanisti is that after all, uh, the best uh, uh, promoter, the, uh, the people who brought uh, uh, transhumanists uh, on the first page uh, of uh, newspapers uh, and on TV channels and so on uh, are not actually uh, transhumanist uh, activists, uh, but rather their opponents. Sometimes uh, they uh, try, for uh, polemical reasons, uh, to project a distorted image of what uh, transhumanism is. Uh, other times, in fact, uh, they uh, are quite uh, accurate in describing what uh, transhumanism may, uh, might be, but uh, simply they, take, uh, they make uh, the, the opposite choice. That is, uh, we have to uh, agree to disagree, probably, uh, unless uh, some common ground can be found uh, upon which uh, to argue uh, with them. But the important thing is that uh, for them, uh, transhumanism, even though at uh, this level of uh, uh, organization as a movement uh, is uh, still relatively weak. Uh, transhumanism is uh, still for them the crucial issue of our age. And uh, who can uh, disagree with that? So where does this lead us? The, we have a nice uh, clipper board here. And let us imagine that uh, three men were thrown uh, on board. What are the 
attitudes of those three men. The first imprecates the fate that brought him there and insists that involuntary passengers like himself shouldn't abandon the, the ship altogether using the lifeboats or even swimming if necessary. The second suggests that a rule is imposed that prohibits an interference with the random drifting of the boat keep our hands off, except for its maintenance. And he's above intent to grab hold of the available rations at the best bear, the, say, the capitalist attitude. Or at most to find some way to divide them equitably so as to maintain peace of board and equity and so forth, which may be, say, the moderate left-wing approach. What instead matters to the third man is the possibility instead to steer the boat where he wants, learn to maneuver it, and decide on the route to follow. And this uh, uh, third stance is what I'm uh, making reference to. So and are you, are you this the is third man. Uh, are you the third man? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. And uh, we can call uh, this uh, third stance without going too deep here into different uh, shades of meaning of these terms, which of course exist. Transhumanist, posthumanist, postmodern, futurist, uh, or overhumanist. There is uh, some overlapping, as uh, the picture shows. Uh, this is uh, by far not an entire uh, overlapping of those concepts. And I was uh, wondering whether it would uh, be worth uh, to organize a context uh, with uh, this picture, telling you that uh, the first uh, to send me an email with the names of, of all the people here uh, was uh, entitled to a free copy of the book. But uh, let me be uh, of uh, some help. We have uh, Nietzsche first, uh, François Lyotard at the top. Then uh, uh, Nietzsche, we know who he is, uh, I assume. Uh, François Lyotard uh, is a postmodern author who uh, actually dealt uh, with uh, the posthuman condition in depth. Then we have uh, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, the founder of uh, Italian Futurism. And uh, you know the manifestos uh, and the challenge to the stars uh, and the, the age of, uh, of, sp of speed, of velocity. Then we have Max Moore. Uh, at, the at the bottom we have uh, Peter uh, Sloterdijk and then uh, on the left uh, we have Martin Heidegger. But the third man, besides my metaphor of before, is also a key concept uh, of the anthropological view which I espouse, uh, the, which is uh, typical of uh, the men who want to maneuver the boat. And in this uh, anthropological view, we find first uh, in history the first man, and the first man being the immediate product of primary hominization. What is primary hominization about? Uh, the event of language, of hunting, uh, hunting gathering societies, uh, of a shamanic magic that allow him to identify with models borrowed uh, from the environment uh, in which he is uh, immersed. Uh, so that uh, he uh, can compensate uh, for his natural deficiencies uh, and uh, to take advantage uh, of uh, his ethological plasticity. That is, uh, the man, uh, the, the first man, uh, rapidly became the, the only beast. That is, uh, he can uh, ethologically uh, adapt uh, to many different uh, challenges uh, and environments uh, and uh, requirements. And uh, this is a concept uh, which is especially well illustrated uh, by the philosophical anthropology of Arnold Galen. Then, uh, after uh, a few hundred uh, so, uh, thousand years, uh, something uh, entirely new happened. And uh, after centuries and millennia and hundreds of millennia where not much was uh, changing, but perhaps uh, for a very uh, small and uh, linear increases in uh, the uh, world of demography and in, uh, say, the sharpness of tool and things like that, uh, we, we had a, a dramatic revolution, a dramatic revolution which uh, saw the coming of the second man. The second man is the man of uh, Neolithic, uh, the, uh, with the advent of uh, agriculture, 
of politics, of religion, of the division of labor, and what that has come to be called the pirate technology. The first man had the fire, but it was uh, just a say to keep him warm in, in winter time. And uh, it is also the time of uh, great uh, Spenglerian cultures. That these uh, chimps uh, are organized into tribes, uh, but uh, some tribes uh, may have uh, some specific feature, but basically is uh, a single species with a single ethology and with a single way of life. With uh, the advent of uh, uh, Spenglerian uh, cultures, uh, uh, things uh, changed uh, dramatically for our species uh, because uh, we d diversified uh, very quickly, even at the biological level, because uh, the cultures themselves are selected for different uh, models, of course uh, depending on the, their natural uh, uh, environment, but also depending on their aesthetic, aesthetic uh, sexual and philosophical preferences. At the same time, already at the time of the second man, the natural environment has now become a cultural environment for good. Uh, green uh, um, uh, people, environmentalists, uh, think uh, how nice is the country as opposed to, uh, say, the center of London. But the truth uh, is uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, even uh, the uh, country in the age of uh, uh, the second man uh, already had uh, very little which is natural. We do not have uh, this kind of scenario on, a, on any planet which is not inhabited by men. Deforestation, agriculture, uh, the um, partitioning of uh, territory. The uh, territory was uh, profoundly, deeply transformed uh, by the human presence. And in fact, not only is uh, the natural environment from now on shaped and influenced by man's presence, but uh, the specifically human factor has become inextricably woven into the purely biological data in a combined action which affects the single individuals uh, as much as, uh, as it affects uh, the selective pressures uh, forging the genetic lineage. It means uh, that uh, the environment uh, where the second uh, man uh, lives uh, change uh, uh, his uh, phenotype because we are subject to the kind of life we live, uh, to the kind of food that we have, uh, to the uh, kind of uh, medicine we practice uh, and, so, and so forth. But at the same time, the second man already alter the selective pressure which uh, uh, after a while uh, change uh, his uh, uh, genetic, uh, his uh, uh, genotypical profile. Then what comes? Uh, the third man again. And the third man represents uh, the transition from a merely transformative action of one's own cultural and natural envi environment uh, to the full responsibility of a direct determination of an environmental context, uh, context uh, and of an identity that is also biological, which, uh, both, uh, with which uh, both, uh, henceforth, uh, can only be true and through artificial. That is uh, the uh, age of the third man. Uh, not only man uh, is uh, shaping uh, nature, but uh, nature does not exist uh, anymore, at least uh, in the space uh, which can be reached uh, by uh, our species. The nature exists uh, on Mars, uh, apart for the presence of a few uh, rovers, but uh, it does not exist uh, on Earth anymore because uh, there is not a place on Earth uh, or even in the, close, uh, um, in the closest outer space uh, where the uh, presence of man uh, is uh, not felt. And uh, uh, there is uh, not uh, a natural thing anymore because a park uh, or a myopic eye is by now no more natural than a satellite uh, or a cybernetic prost uh, prosthesis, uh, both being products of human choices. That is, I can correct uh, the myopic eyes uh, with uh, contact lenses, uh, but uh, in a while uh, through uh, the manipulation of our germline, or uh, uh, I can uh, decide that they're not going uh, to uh, build uh, uh, condos uh, in a certain area because I wanted to have a, a natural park there, 
but uh, the natural park is not natural. This is uh, the product uh, of a human choice uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, organized and maintained uh, and uh, uh, directed by a human choice. But what is uh, the second man really about? Uh, that is uh, how, how did it change uh, our worldview and what kind of uh, problems uh, uh, did uh, he create? At a point in time, the second man said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So this is the primitive Promethean scene and what happened when the second man decided to build himself a city and to, to challenge the stars in a pre-futuristic uh, uh, way. The Lord replied, indeed the people are one and they all have one language and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one's, uh, one another's uh, speech. So what we have here is, uh, say, an act of uh, pride, uh, the uh, birth of uh, an ethic of uh, greatness uh, where, say, the uh, societal uh, um, goal was uh, uh, to build uh, something uh, uh, challenging uh, eternity uh, and challenging the nature, challenging the limits uh, of one's action. And uh, at the same time we find a course uh, where the diversification of our own species uh, into uh, populations and cultures uh, and uh, political subjects uh, is uh, seen uh, in fact uh, not uh, as a, a wealth of our species but rather as a course. And in fact, uh, if you are not a neo uh, by the changing, by the facts in changing the slides, uh, what uh, happened uh, uh, opposing uh, the, uh, the choice uh, and opposing uh, the, the challenge of the second man is that we find uh, a scenario of uh, post Neolithic culture, and we can list them uh, quickly. First, we have the societies which remain uh, at the Paleolithic level, that is, uh, we, um, which go on uh, with uh, hunting and gathering and the Paleolithic lifestyle, which is by no means uh, a bad one, because for, for example, uh, nutritionally speaking, uh, it appears uh, that we started going back, say, to the life expectations uh, beside um, um, infantile mortality and so forth. Uh, and so forth. Uh, we went back, say, to the life expectation of hunting and gathering societies uh, just uh, with the birth of uh, modern medicine uh, in the 19th century. But uh, say the Australian uh, Aboriginal people or the non Negroid population of Africa, such as the Khoisan or the Pygmy, uh, chose uh, to go on uh, the uh, old ways. Uh, they uh, became uh, fragile cultures because uh, to uh, go on with this lifestyle, uh, you are uh, exposed to the pressure of uh, post Neolithic societies, uh, and of course, you need a lot of uh, territory. Uh, to uh, maintain a relatively small uh, population, so you also have a demographic challenge uh, and uh, uh, you spend uh, most of your time uh, looking for food actually, but uh, some societies decided to stay the, the old way. And then there are the uh, cultures which embraced uh, the Neolithic uh, revolution and uh, we can uh, split them uh, into three broad categories. The first are called the societies, uh, that is, uh, they embraced uh, the uh, Neolithic revolution, they brought it uh, to a certain stage, uh, then uh, they told themselves, okay, that's fine, we have uh, iron technology, we have agriculture, let's go on forever the same way. And uh, many, uh, many African cultures, uh, historical African cultures uh, did that. Then we have uh, warm cultures, which are in a way prey of history, that is, uh, they uh, try to uh, organize the, the change uh, into social structure and uh, 
uh, handle conflicts uh, and uh, uh, organize the collective survivals uh, and uh, accept uh, and embrace uh, some changes which often comes uh, which often come from uh, abroad. Uh, and we have years, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, pre-Columbian um, cultures, uh, the Inca, the Egyptians, uh, the uh, ancient uh, Chinese. And then, of course, we have uh, the <coughs> hot culture, which uh, uh, Spengler called uh, the Faustian culture, which uh, embraces uh, the change in full, and uh, which uh, sees uh, change uh, and innovation as a uh, value per se. Faced to that, however, and uh, this is the reaction I mentioned before to the revolution uh, introduced by the second man, we find that people who accept and embrace uh, the uh, consequences of the Neolithic uh, revolution, but at the same time uh, have uh, a kind of moral refusal of its implication. So a moral refusal, refusal of uh, history, technology, self-determination, cultural diversity, idolatry, that is uh, to make monuments, uh, to make uh, art, uh, and then to adore it and to identify with uh, the, your own cultural products uh, of becoming of collective destiny and uh, so forth. The second man then, depending on uh, your uh, uh, personal stance, uh, even in contemporary uh, societies, uh, he may be interpreted uh, either as a blessing or a curse. And we have, uh, uh, across uh, the history of the second man, uh, a permanent uh, confrontation between uh, the prophets of the end of history who say, uh, okay, we are living uh, in uh, a valley of tears, uh, we lost uh, our primitive uh, happiness and the peace uh, and the golden age, but at a, at a point in time, if we are virtuous, uh, we will get it back, uh, perhaps uh, with uh, some uh, additional perks, uh, such as abundance uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, and uh, the prophets of the end of history are the people who, across the uh, history of uh, the second man, have been opposing the wise men, the builders, the founding heroes, and the poets. The uh, people who wanted to make uh, gods uh, of themselves, uh, uh, in the sense uh, where gods uh, were the uh, people in uh, the tra traditional ethnic and religi religions uh, which uh, introduced, uh, which founded uh, a new uh, a paradigm, a new system, a new subject, a new tradition which uh, created a, a cultural uh, identity uh, deemed to, to last for uh, the foreseeable future. But uh, this uh, confrontation uh, is uh, now coming uh, to an end uh, meaning uh, that a lot of things uh, happened quite recently. I put uh, together a few pictures and uh, we had again uh, Dolly and then uh, the microprocessors, uh, DNA, microscopes, rockets, uh, uh, atomic energies, uh, uh, telecommunications and radio telescopes, uh, robots, uh, uh, biotechnologies, uh, in vitro fecundation. So we are <coughs> confronted now with another change of uh, paradigm. And we all know that the prophets of the end of history established a kind of hegemony which in Europe started from 400 to uh, um, 1400 uh, Christian era, which was later expanded in area colonized or influenced by Europeans uh, and also Muslims, westward and eastward. And uh, this uh, by, uh, was by no means a pacific process, uh, but uh, uh, before, uh, during the Middle Age, uh, before the uh, Italian humanism, uh, it could be said that, that uh, the prophets of end of history managed to succeed and uh, to cre create a widespread uh, attitude where uh, the uh, task of uh, the, the humankind was uh, to uh, wait for the, the end of days uh, uh, first, uh, say, just uh, being uh, virtuous uh, and hoping in a divine, uh, final judgment of a divine nature, 
then uh, there is a progressive secularization of the concept uh, and the end of history started uh, being uh, deemed as possible uh, even on, uh, on Earth. But uh, the, the real thing was uh, to uh, the important thing was not what, what uh, one could do in uh, uh, history, but rather uh, one could position uh, uh, what one could do to position himself uh, in view of, a f of an end of history. But what happens uh, well, during uh, this uh, progressive uh, hegemonization by the prophets of end of uh, history of our culture? The related repression of the Neolithic spirit uh, led, however, to something which was uh, uh, entirely unheard of, even in uh, ancient times, uh, that is uh, the birth uh, first uh, of uh, modern uh, science. And the picture represents uh, the trial of uh, Galileo by the, by the Catholic Inquisition. Then, uh, and more importantly from our point of view, roughly in the period uh, uh, 1870 uh, uh, to 1970, to first uh, uh, philosophically to the death of God uh, and to an uh, unprecedented period of techno scientific, uh, cultural, artistic, uh, political, social, and economic uh, incandescence, of which we are the perhaps in the serving heirs. In, uh, there is a period which is around, uh, uh, which lasts uh, around uh, 100 years where uh, everything uh, changed uh, at a very uh, quick pace uh, and uh, uh, everything from our scientific uh, vision uh, uh, view of uh, the world uh, to the uh, technological tools which became available uh, the, the, the rate of the introduction of those things uh, increased by order of magnitude and uh, this is what uh, brought us there and brought us uh, To, outside, to the verge of a tight umbruch, uh, to a rapture of times. Uh, and this rapture of times was announced uh, uh, after a fashion, that is, uh, this is what uh, the uh, prophets of the end of history uh, were expecting. But this rapture of times, uh, this, this breach, uh, this break, uh, is open on either the end of history and an eschatological return to paleolithic naturality and immobility a secularized rapture from the Babel course. Or the opposite, uh, the, another, the alternative scenario is a regeneration of history at a new level in a fully new paradigm on the same scale of what we have seen uh, happening uh, with the Neolithic revolution. So we come now to the transhumanist paradigm uh, uh, paradigm, which is the undertitle of uh, the uh, English version of the book, because uh, what can be a different answer for, uh, from what it is uh, still uh, dominant, uh, that is uh, business as usual, or uh, my God, uh, let's uh, try to stop it uh, uh, on a universal scale, whatever the price. Let's uh, emphasize uh, once more that what we are facing is a quantum leap uh, because the second man explored uh, and changed uh, its ecological environment and himself uh, by the implicit uh, societal programming and the eugenic manipulation of his living environment and populations. So driving, uh, in fact, uh, his own evolution, including uh, as an extended phenotype, uh, a concept introduced again by Richard Dawkins, which was mentioned, who was mentioned before. But uh, this uh, was uh, just uh, what uh, the uh, second man could do. Now we are now challenged by an increasing ability to design what uh, we and our offering, offspring uh, are going to be in a space increasingly subject by our influence. How are we uh, able now to design what we are? Through a direct intervention, not just uh, through selections or uh, by influencing uh, environmental parameters, uh, but uh, through a direct intervention on uh, our germlines, our body, our reproductive process, our biochemistry, our mind, uh, our interfaces with the world, 
our information processing uh, mechanisms, and these species uh, we interact uh, with, uh, speaking of biotechnologies, uh, as uh, exactly as it was uh, predicted by Foucault. We have entered uh, the age of uh, biopolitics, uh, where we are uh, faced uh, with the power, which is a power exerted by some people uh, on other people and their living context, uh, to uh, which extend uh, to really their biological and fundamental dim dimension. And to accept uh, this challenge means uh, to play God uh, at an altogether different level from what uh, was uh, possible before. And of course, uh, this is the ultimate uh, blasphemy indeed uh, for those uh, who had hoped uh, to have uh, eventually uh, the end of history and the last man, the, the Nietzschean last man with the rich. Uh, we were the, almost there, that is, uh, Fukuyama was quite happy about that. And then a few years later, he decided uh, to write, uh, to write uh, instead uh, our posthuman future, the consequences uh, of the biotechnology revolution. History was about to end. Uh, uh, a kind of uh, a consensus upon uh, the fact uh, that uh, perhaps uh, we could go uh, forward uh, just uh, the way we uh, we were doing uh, was reached uh, and uh, we, we thought uh, that we uh, were looking uh, just at more of the same thing uh, and then uh, uh, the uh, people, the uh, bio uh, and the bioconservative uh, are now rightly so concerned uh, by the the possibility of a post-human future, which is a possibility introduced by the biotechnology revolution. But if modernity is over, what is going to replace it? Here we have a, um, a quote uh, uh, by um, uh, Arnold Galen again. And Arnold Galen was writing that uh, in uh, Belle Epoque or perhaps the 20s and this was quite visionary in his age and at that time he was writing the Industrial Revolution which today is drawing to a close marks the fact marks in fact the end of the so-called advanced cultures that prevailed between 3,500 uh, uh, before Christian era until after uh, 1800 the Christian era. And the forces, uh, the emergence of a new kind of culture as yet uh, not well defined. Along these lines of thinking, one could indeed come to believe uh, that uh, the civilized age uh, as historical period is about uh, to pass away. If one understands uh, the word civilization, in the sense that has been exemplified by the history of the advanced culture of humanity until today. Transhumanism is uh, just a choice, not a fate. This uh, uh, is a point where I distinguish myself from a few fellow uh, transhumanists uh, uh, such as Ray uh, Kurzweil. Uh, for instance. I remember that uh, this was in fact uh, the subject uh, of uh, my intervention uh, the last time I spoke in London and uh, we uh, are sometimes uh, persuaded that uh, uh, the perhaps uh, or at least the bio libertarians are that we have just uh, say to uh, be a, a cheerleading, uh, a cheerleading uh, uh, cheerleaders of uh, uh, technological uh, uh, progress uh, which uh, is uh, uh, going forward uh, no matter what. Uh, we have just uh, to uh, organize uh, these circles uh, in order to uh, be happy together in uh, congratulating uh, of uh, our achievements uh, or achievements uh, uh, which uh, are uh, expected to take place uh, uh, no matter what. This is uh, uh, not the case. Uh, that is, if we do everything possible to avoid some, uh, that uh, something happens, uh, we can easily manage uh, to do so. The fact that my book uh, was written in uh, uh, the first version was written in 2003, and the science is uh, still reasonably up to date, uh, means that many, many things uh, which were expected uh, to take place uh, actually did not. 
the source belong to the same period of uh, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, Odyssey describes a world where, say, uh, cryonics, artificial intelligence, inter interplanetary travel uh, were possible. Uh, were, um, was it an optimistic view? Uh, my answer is no, that is, uh, it was a, a possible view and uh, this uh, uh, development uh, did not take place uh, because if we do everything uh, possible not to have it, not to have it uh, uh, taking place, uh, it doesn't. If we have a prohibitionist uh, legislation, if we have a cultural environment uh, which is uh, quite opposed or reluctant towards uh, change, uh, innovation and uh, uh, technology in principle, if we have uh, a myopic, uh, short-sighted uh, and uh, um, uh, the distorted uh, economy which does not uh, provide the incentives uh, to engage in fundamental research uh, or uh, for instance uh, in long-term high-risk uh, uh, technological projects uh, which uh, is dominated by the inertia of the stalled uh, which resisted the introduction of uh, breakthrough uh, and even of uh, the development of the breakthrough we end up uh, with uh, a scenario where uh, the Landemeki Charter, where the uh, singing tomorrows uh, simply uh, are not there. Uh, we uh, are uh, looking uh, at uh, some uh, comforting uh, uh, data, such as the one which was exposed before as uh, to the dropping uh, of uh, the cost uh, of uh, sequencing uh, individual uh, uh, genomes. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, it remains the case uh, that we are doing uh, just a fraction of what could be done and what could be in the, the best interest uh, of uh, the societies uh, and the communities concerned. I remember a conversation with my grandmother who died a few years ago, age uh, 104, and uh, the uh, degree of uh, change which uh, she experienced uh, during her life uh, has uh, nothing to do with, uh, with what uh, I experienced in mine. So uh, before uh, uh, being uh, too trusting in the law of accelerating returns, uh, we should uh, think that uh, at a point in time, not just the pro uh, progress uh, was uh, taken for granted, not just the speed of progress was taken for granted, but even the acceleration of progress was taken for granted. And that now, we, uh, the, the only area where we are really maintaining uh, these promises uh, is everything uh, which uh, is uh, uh, strictly related uh, with uh, information technology. And there, uh, even there, we may be hitting uh, walls, uh, and there is a point of time where you cannot just improve on what you have, uh, but you have, uh, say, to, to make uh, the jump to new perspectives, to new paradigm, uh, to, uh, to find uh, different ways uh, of doing uh, the, the same thing. So, uh, this is why I believe that transhumanist uh, activism has a historical role because uh, even though uh, we were not uh, uh, confronted with people who actively resist the progress, progress uh, is not uh, something uh, which uh, is a matter of pers perspective. Uh, if you look at human history from far enough, uh, you see continuous curves. But uh, if you zoom in, and if you really look uh, at what progress uh, has been in the past, uh, you find uh, ages, uh, relatively short ages, uh, where changes of paradigms uh, uh, take place uh, and uh, where uh, people and uh, individuals uh, and the communities uh, uh, accept uh, a challenge uh, which uh, were uh, uh, entirely uh, unexpected and manage uh, to uh, win uh, uh, difficulties uh, uh, against all odds. And uh, this uh, we should be wary of uh, assuming that this is a natural order of thing. And uh, I'm, I believe that it is much more prudent uh, to think that uh, this is an exceptional order of things, uh, an exceptional order of things which we must uh, protect uh, and uh, bring into existence by a political will. So, 
what is a political uh, will about, uh, a, a cultural paradigm which is uh, favorable, which is uh, uh, enabling uh, with regard to uh, the uh, biopolitical revolution. Uh, a fundamental point in my view is that no posthuman change uh, is going uh, to take place uh, without uh, a posthumanist uh, change. That is, uh, the first, uh, the culture has to change, the mentalities, uh, the shared values, uh, the societal, uh, societal goals, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, cultural paradigms within uh, which we live. Uh, otherwise, we cannot expect, uh, say, uh, post-human change to fall in our laps, uh, even uh, if we would be favorable to have one. And uh, what is uh, the real alternative? That is, are we really facing uh, from the quarters of uh, the prophets of uh, the end of history, say, a new middle age, uh, or perhaps uh, plunging again in uh, uh, hunting-gathering societies, uh, or? Uh, can they really uh, manage to bring us uh, back uh, to uh, the all good times uh, uh, of a bygone uh, era? The answer is no, in my view, that is, uh, all those ideas are quite uh, delusional. But what is uh, a quite uh, concrete risk uh, is that uh, instead of uh, a transhumanist uh, perspective, uh, we may be facing uh, the progressive uh, uh, transformation of our societies uh, into a brave new world scenario. A brave new world uh, which according uh, to some people uh, is already under many fashions uh, uh, in place. And of course uh, here we have uh, Huxley who by the way happens uh, to be not just the author of uh, the brave new world but uh, the brother of the guy who coined uh, the word uh, transhumanism and uh, uh, in uh, his uh, vision we can see that uh, many of the features uh, of uh, Brave New World dictatorship uh, were outlined uh, which are still actual and uh, what we have here is uh, in, uh, in the novel uh, which uh, can be downloaded for free is accessible on the web and there are so many uh, pre in print and Kindle and uh, ebook uh, edition and uh, it is a rather short book uh, but uh, it describes quite eloquently a society which is dominated by one worldist uh, uh, biopolitical technocracy imposing a single global model which is a model of a pseudo sustainable stagnation I do not believe for a second that there is something which is really sustainable because of the second law of thermodynamics prevents it. But uh, let's say that we can be deluded that if we keep more or less everything in balance we can uh, go on for a much longer time and uh, this is really what uh, the purpose of uh, this technocracy would be. And in the framework of uh, this uh, uh, the model, lip service uh, is uh, paid to micro-hedonism of individuals uh, and they free to do and go as they please. This is not uh, 1984, the uh, individuals are not uh, struggling and suffering and being oppressed and so forth. They get uh, food enough, they get a nice drug with uh, um, very limited uh, side effects uh, and they, in principle, they even uh, um, uh, adopt uh, random lifestyles uh, which are, uh, however, entirely irrelevant. The same as the movement, uh, the Brownian movement uh, on uh, uh, gas molecules, uh, of a static gas uh, which is not going uh, anywhere, but uh, say the molecules move uh, in, uh, and they, apparently uh, they are free, they believe to be free, but uh, the gas uh, does not go anyway, uh, nor uh, those societies uh, cannot go, can go anywhere, and uh, not much uh, changes from uh, one society to another, even admitted that the uh, plural societies uh, still exist, uh, so that you cannot really even vote with your feet. And even if a succession uh, was uh, possible, 
it would become absolutely moot because what's the point of uh, seceding from uh, something to have uh, just the same uh, as it were or to have just the same at a different level. What also can be found uh, in uh, the Brave New World uh, is not uh, a full Luddite uh, uh, approach uh, where technology is banned. Uh, okay, let's go back to sword uh, and uh, um, uh, iron uh, things uh, to sow uh, the, 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 the fields uh, and things like that. No, so uh, technology is still in place, is, sti uh, is uh, still uh, widely adopted, but uh, its purpose is uh, perverted to, to not to be, say, the, uh, the, the thing uh, giving uh, birth to change, but on the opposite, to avoid any further change, including, but not limited, the adoption of game-changing technologies and researching, inventing, and spreading of new breakthroughs. This has much to do with today's world, speaking of which, a substantial effort uh, is devoted uh, to the adoption of technology about uh, social control and the social control by now uh, also means that the certain individuals uh, and certain countries uh, may be in control in some of uh, some technologies uh, uh, and some others should not. And also that uh, uh, some technologies should not be developed at all or should be developed uh, under uh, controls which may, at the end of the day, prevent uh, their development uh, and adoption. You uh, will remember the, um, I believe it was uh, the Palomar Agreement uh, under which uh, biotechnological uh, um, uh, experimenting and researching was uh, banned for a period, then uh, this collapsed uh, to an extent uh, uh, similar uh, uh, proposals are being uh, put forward uh, with regard uh, to the uh, research uh, about artificial intelligence. There again, uh, uh, sometimes uh, from people who, had, who did much uh, in order to develop uh, entrepreneurial infrastructure and uh, technological advancements uh, which may lead uh, to the development of artificial intelligence. But yet uh, we might have, uh, say, uh, cameras, everywhere in uh, your uh, bedroom uh, in order to check that you are not actually trying uh, to program uh, an artificial intelligence which may be dangerous. Okay, I'm not uh, exactly advocating uh, the fact uh, that everybody should be able to build uh, um, a nuke uh, in uh, his own garden. Of course, uh, we uh, are uh, f uh, confronted with uh, risks uh, and we are confronted uh, to the uh, possibility that perhaps uh, uh, somebody who is interesting uh, uh, in experimenting uh, with uh, the smallpox virus uh, ends up uh, uh, creating another pandemic of uh, smallpox. Uh, but uh, still it's true that uh, one wonders uh, whether a society, uh, one world society where everything is a, uh, a full time control in order to prevent the new technologies from being developed and any game changing breakthrough to be implemented, one wonders if the price is worth paying in order to live in such a dehumanized world. Last point I would care to mention is that in this context, virtual does not prepare and support real but takes its place. Virtual is not uh, the same virtuality that one finds in a flight simulator, which is made uh, to uh, increase, uh, uh, to improve, uh, and uh, to um, hurry, and uh, to increase uh, our ability to, 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 try and to train uh, pilots uh, or astronauts uh, or people who uh, are going to do that uh, afterwards in the real world. Uh, but uh, virtuality goes uh, towards uh, mere entertainment. We can be discussed uh, whether we live in a virtual reality ourselves uh, or if uh, the world is real. And uh, this kind of debate is a little moot in my view because as long as uh, the, the, the fact, uh, the hypothesis of a virtual reality is, uh, in my personal opinion, hardly falsifiable, 
doesn't change much. But we can make ourselves uh, an everyday uh, common sense uh, difference uh, between uh, the world outside there, uh, where we really build things uh, and uh, achieve things uh, and so forth, uh, and what we are doing uh, by uh, having uh, the same scenarios uh, on a movie, on a video games, uh, on a, a virtual reality program, uh, which does not correspond to an actual control uh, of the world outside. Also because the world outside, at the end of the day, has a way to jump in uh, sooner or later. If I become an immortal in a video game, because I have unlimited, li unlimited lives uh, in a video game, I'm still getting older and older day by day. So the general philosophy of uh, the brave new world uh, is to not uh, rock the boat. That is, we should stop, uh, enough is enough, uh, we can improve uh, procedures, we can uh, fine-tune uh, technologies, much of those improvements uh, and fine-tuning uh, and fine-tuning is exactly aimed uh, not uh, at fostering the change but at preventing it. We can instead opt for a post-human future. And uh, here I'm going to quote uh, Nietzsche again. And what does uh, Nietzsche have to say about that? What is good for the individual is as illusory as what is good for the species. The former is not a sacrifice for the latter. <coughs> the species seen from afar is a something just as insubstantial as individual. The conservation of the species is only a consequence of the growth of the species, which is the same as a victory over the species on the way to a stronger species. It is precisely by looking at every living being that one can best show that he does all he can not to concern himself, but to become more than he is. And if one is not much into continental philosophy, I would recommend uh, a, a, an old piece, which is uh, Enough is Enough, uh, a thinking apes a critic of uh, transimianism. I believe uh, that uh, a copy of it is available on the uh, IEET uh, website, but it is easy to find it uh, through Google. And here we have a, a, a monkey, uh, an ape, which is called uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Klump, which uh, make uh, some hypotheses upon the fact that uh, uh, sapiens uh, may be born sometime in the future, uh, and another uh, ape uh, which replies uh, saying uh, that besides the fact uh, that uh, this uh, seems uh, hardly unlikely, uh, is it really desirable after all? And uh, uh, wouldn't it mean uh, a breach uh, and a loss uh, of the Simeonist uh, uh, value and the Simeonist uh, way of life? And uh, this is the best uh, um, response uh, to uh, those, uh, including in our own ranks, uh, which perhaps uh, have a more uh, a perplexed uh, view about uh, the fact uh, that uh, humanism at the end of the day might also be at a certain level a good thing. Uh, humanism has uh, many uh, different uh, uh, meanings uh, in English and uh, uh, even more so than in Italian because uh, uh, in Italian we say uh, humanesimo. Humanesimo is uh, the uh, 15th century thing in, during Italian Renaissance. That is uh, when uh, the, uh, the wise men and the, the scientists of the era replaced an anthropocentric view to a theocentric view and uh, started uh, rereading the classics uh, of uh, Greek philosophy and uh, built uh, modern science uh, and reacted uh, to the hegemony of the Catholic Church. And uh, this is also called the humanism in English. Uh, another thing uh, which is uh, specific to English, perhaps uh, to uh, US English, but I'm not sure about that, is the humanism as opposed to um, religion or perhaps to monotheism. This is rarely used, uh, uh, this is a very rare sense uh, in Italian. You have many, many people uh, speak, speak in fact uh, of a Catholic uh, humanism. 
and uh, this is also say a, a good angle a uh, good meaning uh, of uh, of the word because uh, if uh, one has uh, to choose uh, between uh, say uh, monotheistic religious uh, views uh, and uh, humanist I am of course on the humanist side myself but uh, then uh, increasingly increasingly uh, humanism uh, uh, in Italian, but also in English, uh, it means uh, to believe uh, that uh, there is uh, something uh, called uh, humanity, uh, the humankind uh, uh, version release uh, 2015, uh, which is uh, uh, a value in itself and which must be protected uh, uh, against anything uh, and uh, whatever the price. Uh, because uh, we should identify it uh, as some people uh, in, a, in a specialist sense, as some people identified in other times with the Christianity or with France uh, or with, uh, with uh, the King of England or whatever. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, if uh, we are to uh, accept uh, the full implications of what the biotechnological and the in general the technological revolution is offering us uh, uh, much uh, much must be said in favor of uh, posthumanism posthumanist critical theories uh, uh, in showing that some things which we take for granted uh, perhaps in a broader historical perspective uh, are actually not so obvious uh, uh, and are neither universal nor eternal and we may accept uh, that some of our uh, uh, contemporary point of view uh, may evolve uh, in uh, into different uh, directions because uh, in fact uh, I'm uh, personally I'm quite insistent uh, upon uh, diversity and I'm quite insistent uh, uh, upon uh, biopolitical view where a number of uh, key concept uh, comes uh, even before the actual uh, biopolitical uh, choices uh, which uh, we are called uh, to make uh, collectively so amongst those uh, few concepts I would propose uh, as, uh, as an end to my presentation of today is the fact that uh, we may well embrace uh, a point of view which uh, has not been very popular for a while in Europe, uh, according to which uh, the quest for knowledge, for change, for greatness, for power, for growth, uh, may be considered as a value per se, a, pr a primordial value. The second point uh, is uh, that we can decide to accept uh, to become masters uh, of our uh, of our fate uh, instead of uh, delegating uh, our fate uh, the decisions of our fate uh, to a supposed uh, divine providence uh, or their thinly uh, uh, secularized version corresponding to natural law the market uh, the, uh, the some uh, um, uh, ethical uh, principle which uh, should be uh, self-evident uh, perhaps uh, uh, falling prey of uh, the um, uh, natural uh, naturalistic fallacy that is uh, which supposes uh, that we could uh, deduce uh, from what we observe uh, w w not just the, how the world it is uh, but how the world uh, should be then uh, another key concept for me is uh, as a consequence of what I was uh, saying uh, is uh, individual and above all collective uh, self-determination. In, uh, this, uh, in uh, this sense uh, it must be said uh, that modernity has unfortunately reduced uh, biological and cultural as well as political, artistic, uh, lifestyle, morphological, linguistic diversity. And uh, technology can make it explode again. Uh, the second man uh, brought uh, with him a dramatic reduction, for instance, uh, in uh, uh, biodiversity of uh, uh, natural species, especially through agriculture. In uh, agriculture, a number of uh, um, vegetal uh, uh, species were increasingly selected and modified and reduced because everybody wanted to have, a, say, the kind of rice which is more productive or more gastronomically uh, interesting 
and at the same time many um, vegetal species which, which are competing with your field of rice are to be eliminated and by changing a forest in a, a rice field you are also eliminating other species which may have depended on the forest for their survival. <coughs> This is true about the uh, hot subject of uh, biodiversity, which is of course uh, a richness for the living world because, say, even speaking of biotechnology, uh, by now what we are doing is uh, uh, genetic splicing, that is we take a gene here and we put it into another genome. And uh, uh, as broad as uh, our uh, range of choice is, uh, the more possibility, the broader uh, range of choice is, uh, the broader are the, our chances uh, to uh, find something which may be useful. And uh, the, the, the single genes are the building blocks uh, which should not be wasted uh, with uh, indifference. Uh, and uh, they used to be wasted with indifference by the second man because the second man was. Uh, changing uh, his environment uh, but uh, he was not uh, fully aware of the responsibility that uh, this was going to evolve uh, because uh, there was always uh, something uh, some place on earth uh, which was unexplored and there were there was always uh, something new to discover and so forth now with the technology we can protect uh, biodiversity, the biodiversity and we can even increase it for instance uh, by creating a uh, new species uh, by gene splicing uh, uh, and uh, by uh, changing uh, the feature of uh, existing uh, uh, living being. This uh, uh, includes uh, ourselves because uh, one example uh, which I usually make uh, is co uh, concerning languages. <coughs> languages uh, were, there are perhaps uh, 5,000 languages uh, uh, on the earth right now, many are more evolved. And uh, uh, there used to be a, a, a broader uh, linguistic fragmentation, or at least uh, uh, the many of those languages were in a better shape. Of course, uh, the uh, technology of transportation, but above all, the technology of communication and telecommunication has uh, uh, helped create a trend towards uh, monoglottism which was also, say, embraced for ideological reasons, because you remember that the Tower of Babel, uh, pluriglottism is a course, not a wealth. But at the same time, uh, technology is what may allow to uh, invert this process, because uh, a substantial use of technology was made, for instance, uh, to uh, protect and even to resurrect uh, languages which were not used uh, anymore, and there was, uh, I will mention here, Hebrew, or perhaps we are in, your, in the United Kingdom, Welsh. And if I can make uh, printed grammar and the printed uh, with a very low cost uh, and put them online, and perhaps I have movies in Welsh, uh, and the, if I have uh, uh, websites uh, and uh, automatic translation and everything, uh, it of course uh, uh, helped us uh, to invert the, prog the process and make uh, the choice of one's language uh, an identity statement perhaps but irrelevant as to our ability to communicate with other people. And automatic translation is improving day by day and if I can uh, uh, write tomorrow a paper or make this conference in Milanese dialect and uh, Anders can uh, listen at it in Swahili and perhaps uh, uh, Katarina in, in, in Welsh uh, or in uh, uh, all the English, uh, I think uh, that uh, monoglottism uh, becomes a moot uh, and uh, there again uh, uh, a range of uh, uh, options uh, is broadened by the very fact that, that uh, those technologies uh, are uh, available. And uh, this, uh, this also uh, involves uh, uh, our ability, for instance, uh, to change uh, morphologically and uh, to change uh, even at the uh, genetic uh, level. There is a Habermas say about that, uh, that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, liberal eugenic, uh, as uh, he called that, uh, 
he calls that uh, is very dangerous because different communities uh, may decide to um, uh, seek uh, optima optimality in different uh, directions, so uh, bringing uh, the fundamental unity of mankind to, uh, to halt and uh, to a breach. And uh, my answer is, uh, why should I care? That is, uh, uh, the u unity of man humankind is uh, something which was put forward by technology. I wouldn't be so uh, abhorred by the fact that uh, uh, a few of us uh, may decide to more to speciate. And uh, the, uh, along our Darwinian history, we did it uh, so many times, we survived, uh, we are probably the better off. Uh, out of that, uh, and I, I shouldn't, uh, I wouldn't see why this uh, should be anathema. Another point, uh, another key principle is the uh, so-called uh, proactionary principle. I believe uh, that uh, I found uh, uh, recently a book uh, which is about the proactionary principle, which is uh, the contrary conceptually of the precautionary principle. Uh, but I believe that uh, there again it was uh, Max Moore who invented that. Uh, he promised a book on the subject for a very long time, uh, which uh, he never wrote at the end of the day. But uh, the proactionary principle uh, means that exactly the opposite of the precautionary principle, catastrophic outcomes of doing nothing are morally worse than those arising from inaction and omission. Speaking of uh, um, global warming, which may still uh, generate uh, some controversy, so I'm not taking any stances on the subject, but uh, uh, also because I'm not a climatologist, uh, and uh, uh, what interests me is uh, more the philosophical and the sociological angle of uh, global warming than uh, anything else. And there was a statistics uh, made, uh, a statistic made in the United States, and it appears uh, that the citizenship uh, when uh, polled about uh, the price they would be ready to pay in order to avoid the adverse consequences of a global warming, the answers uh, were very, very different uh, uh, depending on the assumption that uh, the uh, global warming was not topic or not. And this is stupid because if the global warming has adverse consequences, uh, we uh, are facing exactly the same damages and the same harm, irrespective uh, of its causes. So, uh, the break-even point for the prices at which we are ready to pay in order to avoid those consequences should be one and the same. It is not, because if it is our fault, we are guilty, and so it is ri right that we have to pay. And if it is a natural law, what can we do about that? Uh, and uh, so let's uh, manage and uh, let's resign to the consequences uh, which may take place. Uh, on the contrary, the idea of the precautionary, uh, the coactionary principle is that uh, if you want to achieve something uh, or die trying, uh, is even uh, is always better than uh, uh, die, but than dying by not uh, trying. Last point, uh, which is uh, quite uh, fundamental in my personal view, is uh, about uh, popular, which also means uh, plural, sovereignties. May or clay the bloom into hundred flowers, as the Chairman Mao used to say. Let us not keep all the eggs in one basket uh, against the uh, ideas of universal optimality. Uh, there is a philosophical preference uh, for diversity, which I fully embrace, uh, but there is also a practical reason uh, why uh, we, might believe, we may believe as, as humanists uh, uh, that uh, diversity is better. Because if we have uh, one society, one uh, cultural model, uh, one, uh, uh, one world system, uh, and so forth, uh, and uh, this uh, is uh, evolutionary uh, dead end uh, and uh, the, uh, if uh, this is going uh, to uh, lead uh, to catastrophic uh, outcomes, uh, if uh, uh, this is uh, prone to stagnation and so on, what is uh, better to uh, bet on 
than uh, the competition uh, uh, amongst uh, different cultures, uh, different societies, uh, different communities, uh, uh, each uh, implementing uh, uh, its own uh, views uh, and uh, trying uh, to put it uh, forward uh, and uh, see what, uh, what happens, also allowing uh, for, say, a collective but also individual freedom to opt for this or that uh, rather than living uh, uh, all together in uh, the same world uh, which is uh, perhaps uh, not going anywhere. So, as a conclusion, humanism, in the sense I uh, specified before, in truth uh, renounces humanity, if by humanity we mean what made us become uh, trans-Simeonist in the first place. And this is the name of an abstract concept that denies and courses our historical freedom, preventing us to go where no man has gone before, no ever will. Let, do, let us do it instead. And uh, those are two uh, paintings uh, of uh, a fellow Italian transhumanist uh, which represents, uh, say, the Technosophia, the, 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 uh, the Sophia, the, the, the sapiens uh, in an egg uh, which is going to, uh, to hatch, uh, we don't know what exactly yet, uh, and uh, the humanity as a mosaic of uh, different people, different and diverse uh, people. Thank you. A real tour de force. So many concepts covered and so, such a widely spread of ideas. Let's say uh, have some comments and questions from the floor. Uh, Anders. Okay, I really enjoyed this. Uh, of course, I also need to, to kind of defend a bit of us in the existential risk community because you kind of did a bit of <coughs> implicit criticism of us, and I think it's an interesting problem you bring up. Because we are con very much concerned about trying to prevent existential threats to humanity. We know we have rather dangerous bedfellows. Uh, so I think the important issue here is if there exists a risk that might end up destroying humanity, that is about uh, trying to avoid becoming zero, then there are those stasists who think that yes, we should develop technologies of control in order to prevent either sliding backwards or losing value as they see it. And uh, there is a great deal of difference here. Uh, the Brave New World scenario is all about uh, the force of stasis using social technologies of social control. While we who think that humanity is really great and should be developing, we're worried about that the very positive future we could have could be lost if we uh, slip up. Now, the fundamental problem we have, of course, is many of the technologies necessary to prevent, for example, people from brewing up smallpox or uh, developing dangerous AI. They're in themselves very risky technologies, which I think is an important unsolved problem. How to develop them in a way that's actually compatible with the diversity of the open and the future and we're seeking, seeking together. Yes, my concern there is that uh, if uh, by preventing uh, the developments of uh, certain new technologies, we end up uh, stealing uh, uh, humanity from uh, what uh, humanity is about, uh, Saving humanity is a pointless exercise. That is, uh, one wonders uh, upon the fact that, uh, uh, say, um, uh, IAs, for instance, uh, AIs in English, uh, <laughs> may uh, develop uh, and uh, take our place. Uh, I, I wrote an essay about that, uh, uh, assuming that uh, either uh, um, an artificial intelligence uh, is a full uh, Darwinian uh, individual and in this uh, sense uh, cannot really be uh, distinguished by uh, uh, a human being or an uploaded human being or an artificial human being or the opposite is uh, just to say uh, a glorified uh, uh, screwdriver where say uh, uh, a purely artificial intelligence uh, and uh, an equally powerful computer which is not intelligent uh, but with uh, and the winian agent at the keyboard, the say a human being as a peripheral of uh, the uh, computer, uh, one and the same in terms of, uh, of risk. But one may, may wonder if uh, we have an artificial intelligence which uh, develops uh, in a fashion which we may not uh, recognize ourselves into, 
So we are losing uh, some ineffable uh, feature of humanity and so forth. But if uh, by adopting uh, a number of uh, technologies uh, which prevent the risk of uh, such uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, being developed, uh, what uh, am I really saving uh, if, uh, say, the, the push towards uh, the unknown uh, and uh, if uh, the, uh, the pressure uh, towards uh, self-overcoming uh, is uh, prevented uh, to, to develop uh, and uh, to take place. That is, uh, the, uh, I'm not especially um, speaking, say, of the defense of humanity. Uh, humanity in 2015 uh, is going to uh, go extinct uh, no matter what uh, within the next uh, 50, 70, not, not 50, but 100 years, let's say 100 years, why out of old age? So we are not speaking of uh, the survival of uh, individuals currently in existence. Are we speaking of the survival of a certain uh, species uh, with uh, some uh, uh, specifying features and so on? Uh, this species is going uh, to change uh, along the, uh, a long time uh, and uh, even if it takes uh, uh, one million years, uh, from a genetic point of view, uh, I assume that we might not be recognizable anyway, even out of uh, the traditional mechanism of uh, mutation and uh, selection. So what uh, does it uh, leave us? Uh, do we think uh, that uh, uh, there is uh, something which should prevent uh, further uh, evolution because uh, uh, in a way we should be faithful uh, to uh, a, a species uh, per se as it is uh, try to uh, perpetuate it uh, no matter what uh, when uh, the meaning of that species the glory the the the, the interesting angle was that it kept changing a long time i have no final answers uh, to the fact uh, that we might go extinct out of uh, the experiment of a mad scientist uh, but uh, I'm also concerned by the fact that you may be throwing uh, the baby with, uh, with the dirty water. I don't know how the say goes in English, but <laughs> we understand my meaning. But you recognize some caution because you said you wouldn't like lots of people to be experimenting with nuclear bombs in their bedrooms. Yeah. <laughs> because in that case, what might come after humanity would be dust, the radiation, which wouldn't be a good evolution. We wouldn't mind in a sense that what comes after us is somewhat better and an extension and a fulfillment of our potential. But if but what uh, comes after us is a, a mindless AI which uh, does stupid things, then that wouldn't be a, a good outcome. But uh, this is an also an interesting angle because we are fighting uh, against a lower threshold, meaning uh, that uh, if uh, uh, we uh, 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 once upon a time, say, the United States, uh, uh, through the Manhattan Project, uh, developed uh, an atomic bomb. And it was uh, really a, a societal uh, a project with an enormous investment with uh, two different teams uh, which were investigating uh, plutonium-based and uranium-based. Uh, and there was, a, uh, there was a war in place uh, and uh, this uh, was uh, seen as the essence of the survival of the camps itself and so forth. And then uh, the uh, the, the technological threshold uh, and the technological expertise uh, and investment involved uh, in creating an atomic bomb uh, kept lowering and lowering. And there is a, a, a point uh, where, for instance, uh, if uh, one uh, uh, wanted to uh, create uh, an international ban or, or an international control system ab uh, about, uh, say, biotechnologies, where, say, the um, where this uh, gets back uh, to the level where uh, any child uh, can play with uh, the, uh, his chemistry set uh, and uh, create a new organism, how are we going, uh, what are we going to do to tie the hands of the uh, uh, children behind their back uh, in order to prevent them uh, from uh, engaging in uh, such an uh, experiment? I believe that uh, historically, normally, uh, more technology managed uh, to reduce uh, the risks uh, involved in technology itself. So rather than concentrating on control, one should perhaps uh, uh, look uh, after uh, what could be uh, technological defenses. For instance, uh, uh, in uh, speaking uh, of uh, um, atomic bombs, uh, uh, atomic uh, nuclear proliferation, uh, it, 
has already happened and is going to uh, to be happening again. But uh, besides the deterrence, uh, uh, we are uh, becoming uh, better and better in uh, preventing atomic bombs uh, being delivered uh, on the, to their targets. And at the same time, there again, speaking of artificial intelligence, uh, I am not so sold on the idea of a single uh, artificial intelligence uh, which uh, engages in a runaway process. Uh, so if there are more uh, artificial intelligence, I can use uh, mine against yours. And uh, there is a humanist concept uh, where there is always uh, this uh, specialist uh, concept, um, this uh, specialist uh, uh, concept of us versus them, where it is a uh, humanity against the machines. Matrix style uh, or Terminator style. While in truth, uh, throughout history, I mentioned in my essay on artificial in intelligence uh, that normally it is a mixed community which are rival to other mixed community where uh, there are men and women and animals and gods and machines uh, which work uh, together for the success uh, of the group they belong to, not uh, just to uh, say uh, the men against the women or the machines against uh, the humans. So I can see lots of points of following up that discussion in the pub, I yeah. imagine. Yeah. We're going to have a very vigorous discussion there. Andrew, you've had a question? Oh, yes. Well, it's semi question, semi comment, and I think uh, it's actually an Italian one uh, to a point. Uh, a biography historian, Gary Wachman, has argued that. Uh, in fact, out of the Renaissance, two different humanist, uh, humanisms were born. And this is partially what you've mentioned, I think, as well, maybe not in this context. So, one humanism was the humanism of uh, Ficina, of uh, early Pica della Mirandola, of uh, Della Porta, of uh, partially Campanella, and so on, what we can call uh, the Faustian humanism, which actually came out of mages and alchemists and was in quite an opposition to the church, right? And uh, then there was the second humanism, which was humanism of uh, Brandt and Ritters. You know, that's what, what you may say, uh, you know, Catholic humanism, and which then became anti-Catholic by driving the Reformation and which at the Renaissance time perhaps did culminate in Savonarola and in the bonfire of vanities and so forth, and in late Miranda was switching sides, right? So I think there is a big problem uh, with the fact that later on, perhaps during the Enlightenment and during the Industrial Revolution, those two were mixed into the humanism. Yes, I agree. In fact, it's a two different, if not uh, opposite, beasts. And if we look at the Faustian slash Promethean slash uh, even I would say Luciferian humanism of uh, Ficina and company, uh, then Nietzsche would fit there perfectly. Yes, and absolutely. Heidegger and so on. But then the Ritter's humanism is sort of those, uh, as you say, uh, the bold and prophet's humanism. And people confuse them and uh, people mix them together and until it sort of stops and they're distinguished to carry on running into ethical problems and so forth. So any quick comment you know, on that before we move to another question? Court. No, I, I, I definitely agree and uh, many traditions uh, contain uh, their, uh, their opposite uh, after all and even uh, say uh, <coughs> monotheism had uh, a role uh, in uh, our history because uh, Probably, uh, let's uh, take, uh, for instance, India. I'm very fond of India, and by now this is a part of the Greeks, uh, and it is a very promising country, and they love the fact that, that uh, they still uh, adore a version of uh, uh, the Goths, which were um, original and autochthonous uh, in, uh, in Europe and so forth, even though the contemporary Hinduism is quite removed from what uh, the classical uh, religions that may, might have been uh, the, uh, the Nordic uh, or the Latin Greek uh, or the Celtic religions that might have been uh, in Europe. But uh, at the same time, uh, I must also uh, realize uh, that uh, not much happened in, uh, in India. They had some Muslims around, but uh, uh, they went on doing the more or less the same stuff uh, and uh, what uh, uh, 
took place uh, in uh, Europe uh, is a uh, unicum in uh, history and the birth of uh, modern science uh, and then uh, of some modern technology plus the century technology is uh, a unicum in the world history and they wonder, I, I suspect, I suggested in my presentation that monotheism may have played uh, a role there uh, first because uh, what uh, doesn't kill us make us stronger that is, it was a kind of a reaction, but to have a reaction, a, an action must be in place. And the second, because uh, perhaps uh, monotheism create, uh, uh, created uh, the idea that man could aspire not to be uh, just on the same scale uh, of uh, gods of the old religion, uh, but really uh, on the same scale of uh, full-fledged uh, supreme entity of, um, of uh, the biblical tradition that is with uh, uh, omni, uh, omni science, uh, omni, omnipotence, uh, eternity and so forth uh, that is uh, bringing uh, uh, human ambition uh, at a higher level. In fact, uh, Gnosticism, we, uh, pub we published uh, on the uh, Italian Review, the Italian Quarterly Journal, of the Associazione uh, Italiana Transhumanista, um, an article about uh, Gnosticism, how Gnosticism may anticipate uh, some transhumanistic uh, theme, that is, uh, this is uh, a kind of uh, being unsatisfied with the existing world uh, and the idea that the man uh, with uh, his own uh, energies and resources uh, may try to transcend it. And uh, this is uh, quite uh, a concept uh, which is quite difficult to understand from a traditional pagan worldview because a man was uh, supposed to be master of uh, the cosmos but uh, living uh, uh, as a part of it. While uh, Gnosticism uh, introduces uh, the idea that okay, perhaps uh, uh, death may be an option but also choosing not to die at all may also be an interesting option. I can foresee more interesting discussions on the pub on that point. I hear on echo on the point I've heard Dirk made on several occasions, which is that transhumanism is the culmination of all the good ideas in multiple strands of uh, philosophy throughout history. And the more that you explore the history of philosophy, the more that you find the people who are anticipating many of the ideas which are now possible to be presented fully in transhumanism. So uh, as we explore more widely. Alex, you had a question? I did, yeah. Just, uh Briefly, um, thank you very much for the talk. It's very thought-provoking, and um, so I wanted to go back to those three buckets that you had—the three sort of the uh, the, the bio-libertarian, the bio-conservative, and the uh, transhumanist. So I interpret those as the bio-conservative, you know, the, the actors in current society would be, say, the government regulators. Um, then uh, the libertarians would be this is like the Silicon Valley mentality of yeah. create a company, commercialize it, and spread it across the world. So my question for you is, who is the, the third bucket? Who are these people, and how do they influence the other two? Let's say that we're coming back to what David was saying before. There is a bioconservatives, uh, which are, well, the, the position is quite clear. They are opposed, uh, and they want to regulate the things uh, in the sense of uh, prohibiting them. <coughs> then uh, the uh, bio-libertarians, uh, in uh, a way, maybe deluded uh, if they think so that uh, the, the market itself, uh, for instance, uh, is going uh, to uh, create uh, some uh, uh, dev development uh, which may be uh, of interest. But uh, this gets both ways uh, because uh, the, the, the market uh, may create developments which are unwelcome. But at the same time, uh, and especially I tend to concentrate on the idea that uh, this is not necessarily going to deliver. Because, uh, for instance, uh, fundamental research has always been uh, funded in history by entirely different consideration. The, the, there was, say, a mecenate, uh, a prince paying for it. Uh, there was a matter of uh, uh, national or um, uh, popular prestige, uh, or perhaps uh, this uh, was uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the endeavor of people with uh, time on their hands, or perhaps uh, uh, this, uh, the investment very often was of um, a military nature because uh, uh, military still in, uh, in Western societies uh, where uh, most uh, corporations uh, are inclined to take into consideration above all things uh, which are going to uh, transform into a higher quoting uh, of your shares uh, the next week uh, to engage in a long-term high-risk research uh, 
project uh, is uh, something which uh, typically, uh, typically is done by universities, by the academic world, uh, which is funded uh, uh, usually with the public funds, besides, uh, say, uh, private funding, but of uh, philanthropic nature, not of uh, business nature. Uh, and uh, the military, uh, because, uh, say, if uh, you end up uh, being uh, uh, wasted uh, by your uh, enemies uh, in, uh, in the next five years, so the fact that you may have saved uh, a little money isn't uh, going to change much uh, as far as your survival is concerned. But uh, uh, there again, my point uh, is uh, that uh, uh, in order to decide uh, what to do and uh, whether to do something and how to uh, invest uh, the available resources, uh, there must be a political will and a political choice. And I personally uh, hope uh, and I personally support uh, the idea that uh, those uh, political choices should be plural. That is, uh, shouldn't be, say, a uh, steering board uh, worldwide uh, deciding uh, whether we are going to Mars or whether we are going to colonize uh, the, uh, the depths of the ocean uh, or uh, are we to invest in biotechnologies or in uh, artificial intelligence. I am uh, more, uh, I have more trust uh, in the Darwinian mechanisms which uh, may, may, might uh, take care of uh, selecting uh, different approaches uh, uh, under which I have nothing against, uh, say, the Amish lifestyle. I'm very happy that they go on uh, living an uh, Amish style. But at the same time, I do not see Amish uh, succeeding uh, in uh, spreading their point of view on the rest of uh, the humankind. I wouldn't like it uh, to happen, but I also think that uh, uh, the uh, Darwin Darwinian mechanisms uh, keeps, uh, keep us uh, honest, meaning that what doesn't work uh, is uh, there to be seen uh, by everybody. If we have, uh, say, a single system where nobody is uh, um, expected, uh, nobody is uh, supposed to decide because uh, decision is a Promethean, a Faustian thing, so that it must be the natural law or the market or something uh, deciding, we renounce again to decision and we are on the boat uh, without uh, uh, where we don't know, uh, we don't know where to go. But uh, the real point uh, is uh, that uh, we do not interfere with drifting uh, because otherwise we might be accused uh, of uh, being responsible of bad outcomes. Very briefly to add to that answer, my my view is that where is this third group of people going to come from? And part of the answer is they need to be given a name. They need to be given an awareness that there are many people who actually don't know such a concept is even possible. But once the idea is given some more publicity, people will think, actually, I'm like that, you know, I, I can believe that. Mm -hmm. So part of the recent push to raise the <coughs> possibility of a transhumanist politics, whether it's one party or many parties, I mean, I actually agree with Stefano, I wouldn't just say it should be one party is the only party that pushes a transhumanist politics, but there needs to be several. And then more people will say, actually, this is a better way to make sense out of things, and this could have a big... I'm also trans thinking of... Uh, different uh, societies uh, adopting uh, a, tra a transhumanist or non-transhumanist uh, attitudes uh, toward, uh, towards, uh, say, the third man turning point, uh, and uh, some of them uh, might opt for saying uh, paleolithical or neolithical, yeah. and some others may still opt to evolve and to develop into different uh, directions. That is, uh, here I'm also speaking of uh, collective decisions, because uh, I am entirely sold to philosophical relativism, meaning uh, that I do not believe uh, that uh, uh, universal eternal values uh, which must be enforced on, on anybody actually exist and so forth. But at the same time, exactly because uh, I am a relativist, uh, I do not believe uh, that all values are equal, because uh, equality uh, implies, say, a common uh, measure while uh, uh, the uh, different systems that may well be incommensurable, so I have to adopt some. That is, uh, I do not care whether they are universal or not, but they have to, uh, to adopt some values and to comply with them, because I know a human community can avoid that. And uh, uh, at this point, uh, even do, for instance, uh, health, uh, and disease and optimality and enhancement uh, are, say, uh, concepts which may not have uh, a universal uh, meaning, uh, 
I can well decide within uh, my own society that, for instance, uh, the deliberate uh, selection of uh, deaf uh, uh, embryos uh, should be forbidden. And uh, this is not because uh, I challenge uh, the claim of the deaf community that to be deaf uh, is uh, uh, a good thing. I do not uh, uh, think it is a good thing. I'm uh, fully aware that uh, this is a relative position. But uh, at a point in time, uh, there must be collective uh, decisions to be taken at a political level, deciding uh, what is uh, uh, what we should look forward to and what we should be wary of. So I've seen many more hands than I have time to cover in the words left, but we will take a few. Let's have some quick questions, quick answers. And the orange? Very quick question. What do you think is the best way of stimulating and getting a broader and better understanding of these issues in society? I think um, organized transhumanism may be a way. <laughs> and I think uh, I am... Uh, quite uh, sympathetic uh, with the efforts uh, uh, currently under place, uh, including in Italy, to establish uh, at least uh, symbolic uh, transhumanist uh, parties. But I think that the real uh, uh, crucial area is a metapolitical action that is uh, the effort uh, to uh, influence uh, uh, mentalities, uh, values, uh, cultural products, uh, and uh, 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 general attitudes by the public uh, uh, on uh, substantial issues. Uh, we realize, uh, for instance, uh, that in, uh, in Italy there is uh, a quite a uh, transversal, perpendicular uh, split uh, between uh, uh, people uh, of uh, different uh, uh, political persuasions, uh, uh, among things uh, which, uh, in our view, are much more crucial than uh, the, 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 the normal uh, political divide, which is sometimes uh, a bubble uh, about, uh, say, the uh, business committee you are supporting, uh, the vested interest that you are supporting, uh, and so on. <coughs> so I think that uh, there again, uh, taking an, another time, um, one time more from the, uh, uh, another page from the, the Catholic tradition, uh, uh, the Christians used uh, to have uh, their own parties uh, and at the same time to have a substantial power presence uh, in all the other parties uh, and at the end of the day whenever say a crucial uh, thing, a thing which was important from their point of view everybody uh, was falling into line, is still falling into line and supporting the same values and the same choices uh, even do they belong uh, to competing political parties. So I'm very much in favor of having being a, say, a transhumanist a president of the United States, for instance. But uh, at the same time, I think that uh, what is uh, uh, above all crucial is uh, that uh, certain ideas are widespread uh, and offered as an option to as many people as possible through uh, cultural activism. Cultural uh, activism. Yes. Which means publishing not just uh, websites, books, uh, uh, articles in uh, journals, uh, uh, by penetrating uh, the uh, mass media, by uh, participating to debates, by organizing this kind of events, uh, and by uh, discussing one's own idea, ideas in one's um, uh, social uh, circles. Halfway back there, yes? I, I have a couple of I think, related questions. Um, one is on the dismissal of Habermas's uh, kind of uh, I can't objections. Really hear you. Sorry, um, uh, the the dismissal of Habermas's uh, ethics, which I would have thought are founded on the kind of uh, Levinas's view of the face of recognition, and that concept, that ethic of fairness, if that's dispensed with. What's it replaced by in transhumanism as a kind of fundamental effort to how you um, negate worries about the differences that are going to start to appear between people? And I think related to that is the John Gray objection, where you see transhumanism as an ideology which has a teleology towards a technocratic kind of division of society. I, I read Huxley is saying that there isn't an alternative to that structure if you are following transhumanist ideas, that is where you will end up. And I was just wondering whether you could comment on those, because yes. that's where I, I as a biologist, I would question transhumanist kind of agenda. 
Okay, so as I mentioned before, I believe uh, that uh, men cannot avoid uh, to support uh, values. Perhaps uh, they do not uh, uh, comply with their values because one thing is uh, morality, one thing is uh, morals, uh, and another thing is uh, uh, moral philosophy. That is, moral philosophy is about uh, the theory behind uh, the foundation of uh, morals, uh, morals about uh, the values uh, one, uh, one's, uh, one adopts, uh, and morality is your ability to comply with your own values, which is not uh, uh, to be taken for granted. For instance, many criminals has a have a very conventional, uh, have a very conventional morals. That is, they do not have any theory about uh, what should be uh, done, which uh, what should be good and evil, which is any different from any man in the street. But uh, simply, they opt to not to comply with uh, their own ideas about what the morals is. And the same goes for uh, uh, aesthetics, and the same goes for politics. But uh, speaking of uh, bioethics, uh, uh, the idea is uh, that uh, many times when we uh, discuss bioethics, uh, bioethics uh, we think that we have just uh, say, to take uh, ethical concepts uh, which are supposed to be universal and uh, to apply them more or less mechanically to new scenarios uh, so that if I say uh, uh, 3x uh, equal uh, three times uh, uh, x uh, equal uh, y. If uh, uh, x uh, is uh, three, uh, three times three is nine. So uh, the bioethical committee makes uh, this effort uh, where they do not really discuss the fundamental ethics which is behind their choice, but they only discuss how this may be applicable to new scenarios. Being uh, an avowed, uh, uh, a confessed uh, Nietzschean. I think uh, that uh, ethics uh, are a uh, cultural product uh, exactly as uh, art, uh, as politics, uh, and so forth. Uh, and what it is interesting is not what the et et ethical systems uh, uh, in uh, our species uh, have in common, but what it is interesting is uh, what is different be, uh, amongst them. And uh, in, uh, in this sense, uh, I of course believe uh, that we have uh, uh, ethical, uh, as long as we share some basic uh, values, we have uh, some meaningful uh, ethical discussions uh, to be made uh, about what uh, should be looked uh, forward uh, and what uh, should be refused. And uh, this is uh, all uh, fine and, and dandy. But uh, at the end of the day, I uh, take the idea that the many decisions we are faced with are a political nature in the sense that they do not depend uh, on a philosophical stand, stance which should in principle uh, applicable in, uh, in any event uh, and uh, uh, beyond everything, but rather to a number of collective choice which even in the same framework of values uh, may depend simply of a collective uh, uh, decision. For instance, if I choose to uh, have uh, uh, as, a, as a partner uh, uh, Anders uh, or Katerina, this is a, a personal choice uh, and there is, not, uh, there is no right choice uh, uh, which uh, should be enforced uh, or something uh, or which can be inferred uh, from a basic principle and simply applied. But there may be a group of 10 people who decide to become uh, amphibian, as in the, the slide that I projected before, and uh, would like, say, to live under sea, and another group of people who would rather have uh, wings uh, and uh, fly around in the sky. And uh, I believe uh, that uh, when we are talking uh, bioethics, uh, sometimes we try to force a single solution for uh, all kinds of societies or for all kinds of uh, communities and groups of people when we should admit uh, that the pluralism exists. I suspect that's going to need more time in the pub as well. <laughs> Let's try and be very quick. Bob? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested by all the philosophical aspects of it, but actually I'm more involved, interested in the practical aspects yeah. and what we might do following what you say. So I'm really inspired by your five or six principles at the end, and I wonder if you might just put them up again because I'm not sure I've got them all. But the question for you is, um, what shining examples of great practice illuminate some of those? 
or alternatively, what might we be do to make those happen more effectively? Once more, <laughs> sorry, I was trying to bring them up here. Okay, sorry. Um, so there's two parts to the question. Can you give some shining examples of what's happening to drive forward some of those principles? Or if not, what we ought to be doing to make those more applicable? I think that as In just one minute. Okay. <laughs> as, I as I mentioned before, I think that the important thing is the, to offer transhumanism as an option. This is uh, something which is already being done by, uh, by our rivals, our, our adversaries. They are saying, uh, beware, uh, either you are uh, by your conservatives or you end up in uh, uh, transhumanism. So what it is already a big thing is that to show them that uh, transhumanism is a viable option and that this may well correspond to somebody's uh, natural taste uh, and uh, personal uh, inclination. And if we do that, uh, we are already, uh, in principle, commanding uh, half of the world, the, the other half uh, being uh, uh, our adversaries. But uh, by now, many, many things, uh, many, many people think uh, that uh, we are just uh, facing uh, more of the same or business as usual or something which can be steered without any uh, real uh, uh, rapture of, uh, of time. And uh, in, in this respect, uh, when we manage uh, to put forward uh, our ideas uh, in a candid uh, fashion without uh, trying uh, to make them acceptable to those who currently do not like them because uh, they do exist and perhaps uh, they, have, they are right because it is not just a misinterpretation. If we do not have a common ground because uh, uh, somebody may think that uh, it is best that men perish rather than overcome himself. Uh, we can agree to disagree and I can ask the public to take, uh, uh, to take a stance on the subject uh, and that's all. We'll take it as a homework. When I say we, I mean everybody. We should be building up these principles into in due course books. When you mentioned that there was a book on the fractionary principle, actually there's two, I mean the, there is a book on the fractionary principle by Professor uh, Steve uh, yeah, isn't it Fuller, Steve Fuller, and he's spoken on that. But there, there, there probably should be a lot more that, that clarifies this, and we can take it as action. Very final words, Mark. You had a question. Oh, uh, it was a, it, it was when we mentioned when you mentioned the three different areas that, that we could fit into with the boat and then we talk further on that. Well, I'd argue we're all in. We, we, mankind has the best opportunity when we consider that we're in, that I as a trans as a transhumanist. I'm actually in all three boats. There's unknown unknowns that I don't know that I'm not steering whatever I'm steering, and 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 uh, and so on. And, and then that gives me an opportunity to then delve into that and understand the systems that I didn't understand previously. So there's an opportunity, you know, personally uh, in each three of, of those categories that you provided. And I really just wanted to say that the third category, that's most people, I think, on this planet. But they don't and know it yet. A bigger one. But they don't know it yet. Yeah, and, and but when we talk about transhumanism, or, or, there's certain terms, and, then, and that can be a little bit off-putting, whereas when we talk about, well, would you like this situation, you know, would you like uh, your community um, uh, doing better, more people being healed, more uh, people being fit, more people living a life that they, that they love, then that's when the... Uh, you know, that's when we get the yes, and um, technology can be a great solution for all of us. Yeah. The, as, as a conclusion, uh, I would say that uh, I, I think you're right, uh, and the only thing uh, we really cannot do is put uh, the David back in the box. That is, uh, either we force, uh, 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 it is quite delusional, but we can imagine uh, a scenario where people are forced to go back to middle age uh, ca uh, habits, we can imagine uh, uh, a stagnating uh, brave new world uh, the dictatorship uh, where we uh, increase uh, the control and the sustainability of things and we try to avoid risk by, by doing so, but we lose uh, what uh, uh, to be human, uh, what uh, makes it interesting to be humans, uh, or we uh, opt for the uh, transhumanist wager. 
but uh, actually we cannot uh, go back to the uh, time uh, where things were different. We cannot go back to any uh, presumed golden age and uh, expect this to be uh, a kind of cosmic joke, but uh, which can be uh, deleted from. Really great, but I'd say we're still in the steam age with regards to you know, generating electricity. Yes. So we are currently in the middle age. So yes, yes, in the industrial age. As you said, there's a lot of possibilities which haven't happened, which could have been, could have happened already yes. if the mindset yeah. had been different. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so we'll give a vote of thanks in a moment. To Stefano, not yet. So then just uh, a couple of things. First of all, he has brought a few copies of his book all the way from Italy, the English language version. We probably don't want to take them all back to Italy, but way away. So there might be some way to negotiate yes. with uh, uh, if you want to take it and delve into it more fully. Uh, either see, see Caterina or, or, or Stefano, uh, how about that? There's also a chance to discuss this further in the pub later on. We are going to group. In about 15-20 minutes, we'll make our way to the Marlborough Arms, which is quite close by on Torrington Place. And there's also a possibility, this is unusual, we are, because uh, Stefan has come all the way from Milan, uh, a few of us are going to go to dinner with him later. Now, I have to say, this is not uh, London's cheapest restaurant, so, uh, and if you do come, you'll have to contribute to your cost, but there's a, there's, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of slots left on that table, so if you desperately want to have the benefit of joining that discussion, then, then have, a, have a chat with us as well, that's at about half past six. Uh, other things in London Futurist, in two weeks' time in Birkbeck, we are looking at another technology area and its implications, that is the technology of blockchain which is the uh, decentralized uh, authentication me mechanism which underpins the Bitcoin, the currency, but which underpins potentially lots of other disruptions. So we have a speaker who's expert on that. In four weeks time, we have a group of people talking about the future of business. Given all the trends in society, some of the things we've discussed today, the political trends, the social trends, the philosophical trends, and the technological trends, what are the implications for business? And we have in that case something crazy. We have seven speakers who are going to try and do a very brief summary. Not a TED talk, but a mini TED talk of their stuff. Uh, seven uh, speakers in, from uh, who are authors of uh, chapters in a book that's going to be released uh, at, at that same time. So that's in four weeks' time. There are a few other okay. events on the London Futures website. They're not all directly organised by us, but we are often partnering. And so in uh, 12 days' time, if I've got it right, at UCL, there is a talk on what does technology mean for equality? Is technology going to drive greater inequality? Does it matter? And if we want to avoid uh, some unnecessarily abrasive inequality, how can we take advantage of some of the technological trends to address it? So there's a group of speakers there at UCL on that subject, uh, including me. So, and uh, chaired by uh, some of the professors at UCL, including a uh, Guardian uh, columnist and writer. So I think that's going to be another fascinating discussion. Having said all that, I think uh, the more I listen to Stefano Vai, the more I see there is such a wealth of thought here. We're so grateful, uh, we're so, so lucky for the chance to experience some of it. Uh, and let's uh, thank you very much.